Thank you all for coming out. Uh, I don't understand why all of Los Angeles isn't here for Aldous Huxley, but okay, whatever. Uh, I'm glad you're here. So, this is our series on Los Angeles, interpreting the, the city of angels. And what we're doing here is looking at the city through its literary lights. So last week was Ramona by Helen Hunt Jackson, and we had a good time. Even though there was production company here, we made our way through them and had a great talk about uh, a, a protest novel that uses the, the devices of sentimental fiction that became a creation myth of Los Angeles because it was used to sell real estate. <laughs> so what a great Los Angeles story. Uh, so tonight, I'm very excited about being able to share with you the brilliant Aldous Huxley and his mystical Los Angeles. Um, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. First of all, you should know that Aldous Huxley was a badass from the beginning. Did you look like that at age eight? I did not. That is awesome. So Aldous Leonard Huxley, born July 26, 1894 in Surrey, England. So Tinder, where is that? Just outside London. Oh, everything's just outside London. <laughs> okay. The South. And I love in the UK how it's the South, the way it's the 10 here and the North. Anyway. <laughs> Grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, some of you science-oriented people may know. Uh, he was called Darwin's Bulldog because he advanced and defended Darwin's theories on natural selection. A lot of trauma in his life early on. Um, mother's death at 14, keratitis punctata, which is an inflammation of the cornea, which uh, really messed him up, uh, although, well, I'll talk about it in a minute. Brothers, beloved brother, suicide at 20. So once again, a creative, powerful voice of wisdom and beauty, uh, that voice was born in suffering, as is so often the case. He had some pretty good intellectual company, though. Uh, he taught at Eton, the famous uh, London school, and one of his students was Eric Blair. Who knows who that is? George Orwell. How interesting, right? Because when you think of dystopian novels and when you're assigned dystopian novels, you are assigned Brave New World in 1984. And Huxley was Orwell's teacher. He hung out with the Bloomsbury Group, which was a great bunch of weirdos that you may know about, including Virginia Woolf and Lytton Strachey, the biographer. Um, great friends with D.H. Lawrence, um, author of uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover and other things. Died November 22nd, 1963 in Los Angeles. And here is a bit about that. <laughs> with mescaline influenced popular interest in LSD never lost faith in the value of psychedelic drugs. On the day he died from cancer in 1963, Huxley asked his second wife, Laura, to inject him with LSD. It was the same day that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And we were right here in this room. It was then a uh, room, uh, and uh, he was getting very weak. And he said to me, give me a big, big piece of paper. And he wrote uh, intramuscular, 100 uh, microgram of LSD intramuscular. And I filled a syringe with it. and. Uh, I gave it to him. It was very quiet. At a certain point, I said, if you hear me, squeeze my hand, and he did, very weakly. Then I thought, uh, uh, I had the impression that maybe it was necessary to give a second shot, and I asked him, 
he indicated. So I gave him a second shot, and that, well, then it was about four or five hours where there was absolutely no jolt, no agitation, nothing, except this very, very quiet, uh, like a music that becomes less and less audible, like a, a going fading away. There was no no jolt when he died. It was just that the breath stopped. And there was a beautiful expression in the face. There was a very beautiful expression in the face. You may have noticed the date on the slide, November 22nd, 1963, as Laura, his second wife, indicates that was the day President Kennedy was shot. And she recalls that the nurses were all watching the television as Aldous died. Uh, you might also know, want to know that C.S. Lewis died that day. Uh, so what an interesting day. And this is Huxley. He's, he's always got these confluences of things in him and around him that's really interesting. Um, his impression, the initial impressions he made were everything from, well, I'll just, you'll hear. So he was 6'4". Uh, Chris, his friend, Christopher Isherwood, who lived in L.A., uh, said he was simply too tall. <laughs> he said, uh, Isherwood did, I felt an enormous zoological separation from him. <laughs> Virginia Woolf described him as infinitely long <laughs> and uh, referred to him as that giant grasshopper, gigantic grasshopper. I didn't believe this, but this came from his biography that he did not walk until two because his head was so big <laughs> and he kept toppling over. He was called, his nickname was OG because it's short for ogre. Anita Lewis, however, uh, an artist, an American artist, said he had the head of an angel like it was drawn by William Blake. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes. Ah, and his voice. His voice. So, let's get a taste of his voice. Tonight, part one of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels. Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. We are proud to have Mr. Huxley as narrator for these broadcasts. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. These are the sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitute. The year is AF 632, 632 years after Ford. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, and this is the fertilizing room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. And here comes the director of hatcheries and conditioning in person, bringing with him a group Tomorrow, of young you students. Be settling down to... But Aldous moved to Los Angeles in 1937 to be a screenwriter. So no one had ever thought of that before. He was a screenwriter on Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre and even Alice in Wonderland. But Walt Disney himself turned down the script, said it was too weird. I believe he said he understood only every third word. <laughs> so that's a pretty common, as we'll see in the series, that's a not uncommon uh, phenomenon for writers who come to Hollywood. Uh, William Faulkner, F. Scott Fitzgerald, others did not fare so well here. 
He also had a house in Llano uh, over in the, across the mountains. I'll come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> he actually came here, he said, for ophthalmology. He thought he could find uh, a good ophthalmologist, in fact, found one who had some strange suggestions for treatment. Well, first of all, he thought the desert air would help his keratitis, and that's an old, as if you were here last year for our Los Angeles story series, you know that's an old creation myth of Los Angeles that you come here to get well. Um, and so uh, part of the treatment too was, was beyond being, just being in the desert air was uh, looking at the sun because, you know, that helps your eyesight. He uh, was married to Maria Nice, uh, and she is, was part of the Bloomsbury group, and that's where he met her. Um, and uh, she's, she was a Belgian refugee um, displaced by World War I. Very interesting. I, I think they wed in 1919, and again, they're both hanging out with the Bloomsbury group in England, and so this is a very artistic, we might say bohemian, in a kind of a geographical way, bohemian group. <clears throat> Maria was bisexual, and at one point, uh, the Huxleys entered into a romantic triangle with their friend Mary Hutchinson. Um, they did appear devoted to each other, and, and Maria took care of him until her death in 1955, and they had a son named Matthew, born in 1920. In fact, oh, here's a quote. Um, she devoted herself wholly to him. Because of his poor eyesight, she read to him endlessly, even if the material bored her beyond belief. She drove him thousands of miles around Europe and the United States, putting her profession as chauffeur when they checked into the hotel. <laughs> she typed his books and was his secretary and housekeeper. Okay, we know that story very well too. Uh, see Virginia Woolf, A Room of One's Own. And then he married Laura Archera a year after Maria's death. Uh, an Italian violinist whom you saw in the video, and psychotherapist. Uh, she'd been a family friend and she was an equally devoted partner to Aldous um, and explored things with him, shall we say. Uh, in fact, if you look at our brilliant displays out here, I hope you stop sometime and look at those as you come in because our librarians put a lot of work into that. You'll see Laura's book called You Are Not the Target out there. And she basically does, well, self-help, I, I don't really like that word, but you know what I'm talking about, personal fulfillment type writing. And she says, for example, this, which I think is brilliant. At one time or another, the more fortunate among us make three startling discoveries. Discovery number one, each one of us has in varying degree the power to make others feel better or worse. Discovery number two, making others feel better is much more fun than making them feel worse. <laughs> Discovery number three, you probably already know, is making others feel better makes us feel better. That's pretty good, right? I mean, it's distilled basically the world's wisdom into those three discoveries. All right, so um, he was not successful in Hollywood, <laughs> joined the club, but he was very profound uh, in the Los Angeles community. His social circle included uh, Gerald Hurd, who you may have heard of, is pretty well known at the time, philosopher and mystic, Anita Lewis, whom we mentioned already, Charlie Chaplin, Paulette Goddard, astronomer Edwin Hubble, and his wife Grace, and Brit expat uh, Christopher Isherwood, who said he was too tall and was zoologically alienated from him, <laughs> Mercedes de Acosta and Greta Garbo, and I might add Manly Hall. Um, we don't have a lot of, well, we don't really have any information on this. 
uh, other than that Huxley and Laura were Manley's guests at his house here in Los Feliz. Um, we, it is thought that Garbo and De Acosta were among Maria's bisexual playmates in LA's underground and that Maria may have even procured young women for their enjoyment. <laughs> so that's his Los Angeles circle, and of course we've got to have Krishnamurti in here, don't we? Uh, you know Jadu Krishnamurti, the, the great teacher who was to come according to theosophy, and he said, no thank you. Um, he was the world teacher and renounced that role in 1929, but kept hanging around Ojai and found um, Aldous Huxley. Um, and Krishnamurti still lectured frequently, was revered as a teacher still today, um, but he introduced Huxley to the practice of yoga, the Huxleys, to the practice of yoga, and encouraged Aldous to seek or to value self-knowledge and free inquiry versus organized religion with its dogma and symbols. I, I don't think Aldous was especially um, awed by the church and its dogma and symbols, but Krishnamurti certainly steered him away from that. There was also, of course, the Vedanta Society, where he taught frequently. Um, and actually, you'll see in a minute just how much he wrote on behalf of the Vedanta Society. Um, and then he, he moved to the desert for a time uh, to Llano del Rio, like I mentioned. Here's what he said about being in the desert. Silence is the cloudless heaven perceived by another sense. Like space and emptiness, it is a natural symbol of the divine. Silence. Nice. Um, by the way, his grandfather, Thomas, the biologist, invented the term agnostic. This is all part of our service here at PRS. <laughs> Shortly, this is kind of relevant. Shortly after his return to LA, he, he was living in Beechwood Canyon and uh, his home burned to the ground. You can see it there in the uh, LA Times picture. Uh, everything was gone, all his manuscripts, notebooks, family photos, and letters. And the author, had, Huxley, had been recently diagnosed with cancer of the larynx. So he told one of his friends that he felt like the Grim Reaper had him in his sights. Just missed him with this fire. My favorite response was Laura, who says, how beautiful everything was. The flames from the outside were giving to the white walls a soft, rosy glow. <laughs> a few paragraphs later in her book, she admits that there, if she'd had someone to help her, she would have moved things out of there. Um, but she was fine <laughs> with it because it produced something beautiful. What's the importance of Los Angeles to Aldous Huxley? Well, I'm going to borrow some words now from Steffi. Are you here, Steffi? No? Okay. You will, if you want to read about Huxley in Los Angeles, you will do no better than Steffi Nelson's uh, essay in the LA Review of Books. So just Google it. And this is from that essay. She writes this, I would argue that it wasn't until Huxley moved to America specifically to Los Angeles, that the seeds of his lifelong fascinations with technology, pharmacology, the media, mysticism, and spiritual enlightenment fully blossomed and bore fruit. It's often said that the 60s officially began with the death of JFK and with America's loss of innocence. But without the dedicated and well-documented cosmic explorations of Aldous Huxley and his cohorts, the decade would have looked very different. It's not an exaggeration to say that without Huxley, Timothy Leary might never have tuned in and turned on, and Jim Morrison might never have broken through. So, a bit of a challenge to talk about Aldous Huxley because these are his works.
And as a scroll, I'll read to you from the Paris Review article about him. Among serious novelists, Aldous Huxley is surely the wittiest and most irreverent. Ever since the early 20s, his name has been a byword for a particular kind of social satire. In fact, he, was, he has immortalized in satire a whole period and a way of life. That's with his first novel, Chrome Yellow. In addition to his 10 novels, Huxley has written during the course of an extremely prolific career, poetry, drama, essays, travel, biography, and history. And, and I love this Parisian take on Huxley in Los Angeles. It is rather odd to find Aldous Huxley in a suburb of Los Angeles called Hollywood Land. He lives in an unpretentious hilltop house that suggests the Tudor period of American real estate history. That can't be right, can it? Okay, on a clear day, he can look out across miles of cluttered, sprawling city at a broad sweep of the Pacific. Behind him, dry brown hills rise to a monstrous sign that dominates the horizon, proclaiming Hollywood land in aluminum letters 20 feet high. Yes. All right, did we finish? Okay, finally. So what I'd like to do is just present a few of these works, in fact, these works to you and try to give you some of the deep insights Huxley had about wisdom, truth and meaning and beauty and all good things. So you'll see chronologically, here's how they stack up. Uh, Chrome Yellow, Brave New World novels, perennial philosophy, it's philosophy. Ape in Essence, a dystopia. Doors of Perception, we'll talk about, is his account of taking mescaline. And Island, 1962, his last work. All right, so let's get into Chrome Yellow. Nice. 1921, uh, a social satire of the British literati just after World War I. Uh, it it's, involves a perfect character, a hapless poet named Dennis Stone who wanders into this house called Chrome Yellow. Uh, he's very sensitive and he meets uh, Annie Winbush, Ann Winbush, um, who hosts the part, whose uncle hosts the party at this country estate. And basically, I remember one of my deans, be, because I was always talking about postmodernism and teaching postmodernism, he's like, well, you know the first postmodern novel, right? And I'm like, oh, well, that would be whatever. And he's like, no, it's Huxley's Chrome Yellow. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So I think what he meant was there's no plot. Uh, so the, the characters just kind of wander in and out of each other's presence and talk, and, and he's right about that. I don't think that's what makes it postmodern, but uh, still pretty interesting and pretty, pretty courageous first novel, right? Uh, I'm told that the lady, or I'm told, I read that the lady of the house, I think her name's Lady Coddington or something, refused to speak to him for five years after he read this novel because he was satirizing everybody there. So, here are some quotes from Chrome Yellow. The surest way to work up a crusade in favor of some good cause is to promise people that they will have a chance of maltreating someone. To be able to destroy with good conscience. To be able to behave badly and call your bad behavior righteous indignation. This is the height of psychological luxury, the most delicious of moral treats. And again, I apologize for the irrelevance of our text tonight. Um, I don't know how we would apply that today. Um, the, I really love this. It, he hits everybody. So, you know, it's, you kind of have to respect that. He's not picking favorites. He's just destroying everybody in chrome yellow. Things somehow seem more real and vivid when one can apply someone else's ready-made phrase about them. You bring this phrase out triumphantly and you feel like you've clinched the argument with the mere magical sound of the words. That's what comes of higher education. <laughs> 
And related to that is uh, one entered the world, Dennis perused. Um, Dennis is the main character, the poet. Having ready-made ideas about everything, one had a philosophy and tried to make life fit into it. One should have lived first and then made one's philosophy to fit life. Life, facts, things were horribly complicated. Ideas, even the most difficult of them, deceptively simple. In a world of ideas, everything was clear. In life, all was obscure, embroiled. Was it surprising that one was miserable, horribly unhappy? This reminds me of, um, do you know a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Where there's, um, the main character is a teacher of rhetoric, and he decides that um, st students should not come to college at 18. In fact, they shouldn't come to college at all. They should go out, live their life, as Huxley's saying here. And then they would probably come running back <laughs> at some point. But they would come back with life experience to merge with their learning. Men of faith. The men of faith will play the cupbearers at this lifelong bacchanal, filling and ever filling again with the warm liquor that the intelligences in sad and sober privacy behind the scenes will brew for the intoxication of their subjects. You can see Brave New World already, can't you? Yeah. And here, an impersonal generation will take the place of nature's hideous system. In vast state incubators, rows upon rows of gravid bottles, bottles will supply the world with the population it requires. The family system will disappear. Society, sapped at its very base, will have to find new foundations. And Eros, beautifully and irresponsibly free, will flit like a gay butterfly from flower to flower through a sunlit world. <laughs> Eros, beautifully and responsibly free, will flit like a gay butterfly. He means a happy butterfly <laughs> from flower to flower <laughs> throughout a sunlit world. All right. So you've probably read Brave New World. You may have forgotten it by now. I've taught it probably a dozen times, and I still, I still can't remember some of it because I'm old. Uh, but basically, this is well before 19, uh, 1984, which was published in 1948. This is uh, Huxley in, what, what is it, 32. Um, it's, it's a dystopian vision in, with the confluence of pharmacology, technology, and mythology. Um, Set in 2540 of the Common Era, or AF 632, after Ford, 632. Um, because Henry Ford was the model that the society used to produce humans, assembly line humans. Uh, so AF 632. Uh, this, the society now is called the World State. And it's all about efficiency in regard to everything, especially sex. Um, but it's also a pre-programmed caste system. And this is done through technology, embryonic technology, um, in the central London hatchery. You heard him talk about that at the beginning of the audio book. And conditioning center, excuse me, hatchery and conditioning center. Children are created outside the womb, of course, cloned to increase the population, and then deprived of oxygen, the embryos, to produce the various castes. This is dark, <laughs> this is really dark. Um, so the children with the least oxygen obviously become the servants. The children with the most oxygen obviously become the elite and the leaders. Uh, and they're perfect physically and mentally. And these are Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and Epsilon people. Uh, it's really interesting, British literature at this time, because you've got H.G. Wells doing the same thing with the time machine um, and others. Um, so 
One of the alphas is named Bernard Marx. So again, like with Orwell, there's a, there's a deep suspicion of socialism, the emerging socialism. He and his love interest, Lenina Crow, Crown, travel to a savage reservation, is the quotes, where Marx's boss, the director, apparently lost a female companion there some years ago, but you can see what's going to happen. They arrive, they meet people in the savage reservation where they're living outside of this constructed society. And uh, they think they find the woman that the director lost, whatever that means. Um, so, and her son, and her son. So remember, this, this, you can't have a ch child this way. This is wrong. You must have, ch children must be produced in the hatchery. Um, so Bernard brings back the woman and the son and the director is, is embarrassed and humiliated and resigns because his crime of having sex with a woman and a child from having sex with a woman is exposed. Um, <clears throat> John is the savage, uh, and, and Huxley's taken, posthumously taken a lot of grief over this term. I understand, uh, but I think it makes his point too, namely that this is, that while there's a caste system and a class system within the Brave New World, outside the Brave New World, there is even more strangeness. And in fact, that's really the plot of the novel, is John, the savage from the Savage Reservation in New Mexico, um, encounters this brave new world and does not like it. In fact, eventually he runs away to a lighthouse so that he can leave civilization, civilization, this brave new world altogether. And he eventually, well, he has some peace there for a while, but then the tourists and the media find him and he is engaging in self-flagellation. He's whipping himself. Well, this is great television, right? Or a great, a great show, a great story. So um, crowds descend from the helicopters. It's a media event and um, uh, he's whipping a woman too, and then another woman appears, Lenina, and he's, he tries to whip her too. And then um, he takes a whole bunch of soma, which is the drug in Brave New World, and falls asleep, and in the morning hangs himself. Because a human being trying to exist in the Brave New World cannot, with his passions and with the confusion and with all the variables, uh, he cannot exist in this constructed, tightly woven and controlled world, so he kills himself. So here's some words from John. And there's a lot, of, this is a feature of Huxley, is there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of dialogue, in fact, in fact it gets even more so in Ireland by the end. All right, so this is uh, John. All right then, said the savage defiantly, I'm claiming the right to be happy. Well, not to mention the right, this is the, um, I think it's the director, or uh, Bernard. Uh, not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have syphilis and cancer. The right to have too little to eat. The right to be lousy. The right to live in constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow. The right to catch typhoid and the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. You want your humanity, there it is. Why wouldn't you want the brave new world? Then there was a long silence. I claim them all, said the savage. I claim all those things. Give them to me, the pain. This is, again, John the Savage. I ate civilization and it poisoned me. I was defiled. And then he added in a lower tone, I hate my own wickedness. <laughs> I 
I'd rather be myself, he said. Myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. I believe we could make t-shirts of that. Myself and nasty. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of these quotes are from the savage because he's the human voice, obviously, in the novel. The savage nodded, frowning, you got rid of them. Yes, that's just like you, speaking to the brave new world and those who created it. Getting rid of everything unpleasant instead of learning to put up with it. Whether it is, Huxley was a big Shakespeare fan. Whether it is better in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them, Hamlet, you don't do either. Neither suffer nor oppose. You just abolish the slings and arrows. It's too easy. What you need, the savage went on, is something with tears for a change. Nothing costs enough in the brave new world. Good stuff. There was this thing called heaven. This, this is from um, the director, I believe, but it's someone representing the brave new world. There was a thing called, there was a thing called heaven, but all the same, they, you, they, we, used to drink enormous quantities of alcohol. There was a thing called the soul and a thing called immortality, but they used to take morphine and cocaine. 2,000 pharmacologists and biochemist, biochemists were subsidized in AF-178. Six years later, it was being produced commercially, the perfect drug. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. All the advantages of Christianity and none of the after effects. <laughs> Take a holiday from reality whenever you like and come back without so much as a headache or a mythology. <laughs> or a mythology. That's genius. Stability was practically assured. And a, a really efficient totalitarian state would be one in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their servitude. Um, great is truth, but greater still, from a practical point of view, is silence about the truth. Huxley um, wrote this in 1932 again, and then when, Brave, when uh, 1984 came out in 1948, right, uh, he wrote his former student, Eric Blair, George Orwell, and said, nice job, but my vision is more sophisticated and likely. <laughs> so if you know 1984, you know that it, power is exercised through coercion um, and through language, of course. It's not just a military state. In fact, it's mostly through language. But, it, but in Brave New World, you choose your servitude. You revel in your servitude. And again, I apologize. There's no relevance to 2019. But I thought this might be a nice museum piece. <laughs> the perennial philosophy. OK, so I actually heard of this book before I'd heard of Brave New World uh, because of philosophy stuff. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's kind of what most of you probably think in coming here. I mean, I don't want to assume too much. But it's kind of like, you know, the East and the West, there are similarities. And we can talk about those and discover them instead of focusing on the differences. There is a perennial philosophy, an ongoing philosophy that exists. Uh, no doubt this is his Vedanta training, right, Brahmavid? Because it's, it's all underneath there. Um, so he talks about everything with his brilliant wit. Uh, Zen, Hinduism, Taoism, Christian mysticism, Islam, and the perennial philosophy which was a term coined by Gottfried Leibniz, whom you don't know. Um, and you'll, you'll be fine not knowing. Um, what's that? Yes, that's right. And monism. Um, 
It's a metaphysic, the perennial philosophy is a metaphysic that recognizes a divine reality substantial to the world of things and lives and minds. The psychology that finds in the soul something similar to or even identical with divine reality. The ethic that places humanity's final end, final goal and objective of the imminent, in the knowledge of the imminent and transcendent ground of all being, term by Paul Tillich, <clears throat> the thing immemorial, immemorial and universal. So that's Philosophia Perennis. And here are some insights from that book. In all the historic formulations of the perennial philosophy, it is axiomatic, says Huxley, that the end of human life is soma. No. <laughs> Contemplation. Contemplation or the direct and intuitive awareness of God. That action is the means to that end. Contemplation leads you to God. That a society is good to the extent that it renders contemplation possible for its members. Contemplation, that's a function of society, he thinks. This, the society should allow you, should encourage you, should validate you in your contemplation. And that the existence of at least a minority of contemplatives is necessary for the well-being of any society. What an interesting idea. Like, I wonder what would happen if seekers like yourself and contemplatives like some of us, people who are trying to look for the deeper meaning and truths of things, what if those people were removed? What would happen to society? I honestly don't know. I mean, I don't want to claim too much for what we do here on Tuesday nights, but I do wonder, because there has to be some sort of influence in the world from seekers, I would think. Oh, I like this. The man who wishes to know the that, so you know um, this, the saying from the Upanishads, thou art that, right? It's a little lesson given to one of the disciples about the, well, it's repeated often, but it's about, he asked him to, sep he, to pour salt in the ocean, then pull the salt out of the ocean. And the teacher says, thou art that. You are that, there's no separation. So this is actually riffing on that. <clears throat> the man who wishes to know that that, which is thou, may set to work in any one of three ways. He may begin by looking inwards to his own particular thou, and by a process of dying to self, come at last to the knowledge of the self, the kingdom of the self, the kingdom of God that was within, that is within. Or else she may begin with the thou's existing outside of herself, and may try to realize their essential unity with God, <laughs> These are my gestures for unity with God <laughs> and through God with one another and finally with her own being. Or, or finally, and he says this is the best way, we may seek to approach the ultimate that both from within and from without so that we come to realize God experimentally as at once the principle of my own thou and of all other thou's, animate and inanimate. I also love this. I've never heard anybody say this. I've heard it said the other way. Knowledge is a function of being. Knowledge is a function of being. When there's a change in the being of the knower, there's a corresponding change in the nature and amount of knowing. Isn't that backwards? Except not for Huxley. That's really interesting, I think. Knowledge is a function of being. When you change, you know and see new things, don't you? So that's right, even though it sounds wrong. Sometimes the counterintuitive is the true. There's a corresponding change in the nature an amount of knowing. So I think you could probably look back over your life and find that this rings true. 
right? So you, you think, at a certain age, you think, well, by the time I'm this age, I will know this. And you get to that age and you're like, I had no idea <laughs> that there was this other thing, <laughs> right? And I couldn't have imagined it back then. I couldn't even imagine this thing. Uh, I love to do this with people too, like, um, I don't know, uh, when I hear stories, people tell me stories, they tell me a lot of stories, it's great. And I say something like, well, when you were 20 and, and doing this in Bucksnort, Tennessee, and feeling this way, I'm from Tennessee, so I get to say that, um, <laughs> and feeling this way and thinking there was no way out, and here you are in Los Angeles doing what you're doing now, what if current you went back and told 20-year-old you that you'd be here. I do that all the time. I think it's a fascinating exercise. And I would never have believed myself at any point. Right? If you told me I'd be standing here October 15th, 2019, alive, <laughs> and giving a lecture on Huxley, I, I would have just laughed. But isn't that what makes life wonderful and worth living is that you don't know that knowledge comes after being that you change and then whole new worlds open up to you I love this I have never heard this but I think it's right on uh, religion and society religious beliefs and practices certainly are certainly not the only factors determining the behavior of a given society, but no less certainly they are among the determining factors. At least to some extent, the collective conduct of a nation, conduct of a nation is a test of the religion prevailing within it. A criterion by which we may legitimately judge the doctrinal validity of that religion and its practical efficiency in helping individuals advance toward the goal of human existence. Ouch. All right, so the religion prevailing within it. What's the religion prevailing within our society, our nation? He's talking about a nation. Interesting. Uh, we'll come back, we can talk about that in the uh, discussion. Huxley, again, one reality, all comprehensive contains within itself all realities. That is Vedanta, right? I think. Brahmavig can correct me. One reality, all comprehensive, contains within itself all realities. All right. So, yet another dystopian novel. This one's set in California. Well, a post apocalyptic California, a post nuclear California. Um, Mike Davis in Ecology of Fear writes about why we love destroying our city <laughs> and documents how many times it's happened in fiction and in film and it's a lot. <laughs> so Huxley was part of that early on. Uh, 1948, um, he's seen the atomic bomb drop, uh, which you could consider the second fall of humanity in a way. Uh, he, he did, and he wrote Ape in Essence. Um, and it's, I love this, it's, it's about the discovery of a film script <laughs> in the year is 2108. Setting is Los Angeles, where a recovery expedition has been sent here from New Zealand uh, to make sense of what's left of Los Angeles in 2108. Uh, there's, there's always a scientist in Huxley's novels. Um, let's see, this is Alfred Kazin. It was inevitable that Mr. Huxley would have written this book, and you feel like that's true. One could almost have seen it since Hiroshima is the necessary sequel to Brave New World. Mm. So, I won't get into the um, plot too much because it's pretty involved. But here are some insights from that novel. I, I, I love all these, so I shouldn't say I love this, but oh my God, I could kind of live just by these quotes I'm giving you. 
love, and again, the, in these novels, people are given to speeches and philosophizing, and that's great. Um, J.M. Kosea kind of does that now, the South African novelist. All right, here we go. Love casts out fear. This is a character speaking. But conversely, fear casts out love. And not only love, fear also casts out intelligence, casts out goodness, casts out all thought of beauty and truth. What remains in the bum or studiedly jocular desperation of one who is aware of the obscene presence in the corner of the room and knows that the door is locked and that there aren't any windows. And now the thing bears down on him. He feels a hand on his sleeve, smells a stinking breath, as the executioner's assistant leans almost amorously toward him. Your turn next, brother. Kindly step this way. He's talking about death, of course. And in an instant, his quiet terror is transmuted into a frenzy as violent as it is futile. There is no longer a man among his fellow men, no longer a rational being speaking articulately to other rational beings. There is only a lacerated animal screaming and struggling in a trap. For in the end, fear casts out even our humanity. And fear, my good friends, fear is the basis and foundation for modern life. Fear of the much-touted technology, which while it raises, out, raises up standards of living, it increases the probability of our dying violently. Fear of the science which takes away, the, on one hand, even more than what it gives in the other. Fear of the demonstrably fatal institutions for a while in our suicidal loyalty we are ready to kill and to die for. Fear of the great men whom we have raised and by popular acclaim to a power which they use inevitably to murder and enslave us. Fear of the war we don't want and yet do everything we can to bring about. There are times, it's not all darkness in Huxley, there are times, and this is one of them, when the world seems purposely beautiful, when it is as though some mind in things had suddenly chosen to make manifest for all who choose to see the supernatural reality that underlies all appearances. And then there was nationalism. Continuing to quote, <clears throat> the theory that the state you happen to be subject to is the only true God, and that all other states are false gods. That all these gods, true as well as false, have the mentality of juvenile delinquents, and that every conflict over prestige, power, or money, or money is a crusade for the good, capital G, the true, capital T, and B, capital B, the beautiful, sorry. The fact that some, that such theories came at a given moment of history to be universally accepted is the best proof of Satan's existence. The best proof that at long last, he'd won the battle. Myth, he talks a lot about myth. Both are justified in their pretensions, uh, these two. Uh, characters. For each applies to human situation the procedures which have proved effective in the laboratory and the ivory tower. He's actually talking about socialists and authoritarians, but that doesn't matter. The point is they simplify ideologies, all ideologies. Simplify, they abstract, they eliminate all that for their purposes is irrelevant and ignore whatever they choose to regard as inessential. They impose a style ideologies. They compel the facts to verify a favorite hypothesis. They consign to the waste paper basket all that to their mind falls short of perfection. And because they thus act like good artists, sound thinkers, and tried experimenters, the prisons are full, political heretics are worth to worked to death as slaves, the rights and preferences of mere individuals are ignored, 
The Gandhis are murdered from morning till night. A million school teachers and broadcasters proclaim the infallibility of the bosses of the moment who happen to be in power. Okay, let's go on to drugs. So, the Doors of Perception is, is actually two volumes, Doors of Perception and Heaven and Hell. Two long essays on the subject of visionary experiences, transcendence, truth, meaning. <clears throat> the work is, is very philosophical in nature, especially Heaven and Hell, uh, and hard to read and was not well received outside of Southern California. Um, um, so, uh, the first essay, The Doors of Perception, and just for the record, this is where the band got their name, but the phrase comes from William Blake, uh, just for the record. Um, in 1953, um, Huxley wants to test the effects of mescaline, which is the active ingredient in peyote. And, um, so he, he just recounts this. Now, that he would do this, right? I mean, he's a, he wrote Brave New World. He's a successful author. He's a brilliant man. And maybe that's what gave him license to do this. But can you imagine if he had an agent? And the agent said, you're going to do what? <laughs> you're going to take mescaline and write about it? I don't think so. Um, and so it's, it's um, you know, you can read it on your own, but let me, let me give you some insights from it. I wonder, this is just kind of delicious to think about, but do you remember Donald Rumsfeld? <laughs> and do you remember that thing he said about the Iraq War? There are things that are known. Okay, this is Huxley. <laughs> there are things that are known and there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. So what I'm saying is Donald Rumsfeld was on mescaline. <laughs> we live together, we act on and react to one another, but always and in all circumstances, we are by ourselves. The martyrs go hand in hand into, into the arena, but they are crucified alone. Embrace, the lovers desperately try to fuse their insulated ecstasies into a single self-transcendence in vain. By its very nature, every embodied spirit is doomed to suffer and enjoy in solitude. Sensations, feelings, insight, fancies, all these are private and except through symbols and at second hand, incommunicable. We can pull information about the experiences, but never the experiences themselves. From family to nation, every human group is a society of island universes. So you may have come across this concept in R.D. Lang, the divided self, who says that there is a no-thing between us. There's nothing between us. And he's right. There's no thing between us. Um, but then there's the door in the wall. <laughs> the man who comes back through the door in the wall will never be quite the same as the man who went out. Uh, the, through the doors of perception. He will be wiser, but less sure. So what, so what he's saying here is once you have a transcendent experience, as he did through mescaline, he will be lies, wiser, but less sure. Happier, but less self-satisfied. Humbler in acknowledging his ignorance, yet better equipped to understand the relationship of words to things, of systematic reasoning, reasoning to the unfathomable mystery which it tries forever vainly to comprehend. Yeah. Every person at each moment is capable of, capable of remembering all that has ever happened to him and of perceiving everything that is happening everywhere in the universe. Our, to be enlightened is to be aware always of the total reality of total reality in its imminent otherness to be aware of it and yet remain in a condition to survive as an animal our goal is to discover we have always been where we ought to be unhappily we make the task exceedingly difficult for ourselves 
Most leave lives at worst so painful, at best so monotonous, poor and limited, that the urge to escape, the longing to transcend themselves, if only for a few moments, is and always has been one of the principal appetites of the soul. Yeah, I like these. I gotta wrap this up, but I, I love all these. I, I've just never heard this stuff. I mean, I'm fairly well read, but I've never heard anything like what Huxley says here. In a world where education is predominantly verbal, highly educated people find it all but impossible to, to pay serious attention to anything but words. There's always money for, there is always money for, there are always doctrines in, the learned foolery of research into what, for scholars, is the all-important problem, who influenced whom to say what when. <laughs> this is why Manley Hall hated philosophers, by the way. Who influenced whom to say what wh when. He wanted philosophy that you could live by, that you could embody, and it embodied you. Even in this age of technology, the verbal humanities are honored the nonverbal humanities, the arts of being directly aware of the given facts of your existence are almost completely ignored. All right, this is Island, final novel. Um, he thought it was his most important. In fact, after Island, he was going to write a book on Shakespeare, but he died. So this book takes us to the remote Pacific island of Pala, where an ideal society has flourished for 120 years, so, right? I mean, we, we see where Huxley likes to live. Uh, and so what do you think happens? Of course, someone breaks into this island, someone who doesn't belong from the surrounding world. Um, and, and it all falls apart, of course. Uh, the opening is amazing, the opening and closing. Will Farnaby, is awakened by a voice yelling, attention. And he thinks at first it's his wife, Molly, telling him he has to get to work. And then he continues to wake up and he remembers going down a corridor to Molly as she lay dying in a hospital bed. So that's not right. And then he realized he's, he's on Paula after having shipwrecked on the Paula Strait and the voice saying, attention, is a minor bird. A minor bird. And it ends, the novel ends, with, um, with someone, a, a minor bird saying, again, attention, after it all goes to hell. Anyway, oh my God, this passage. If, if you're bored, wake up right now, because you need, this is the one thing you need to hear. It's dark because you're trying too hard. Lightly, child, lightly. Learn to do everything lightly. Yes, feel lightly, even though you're feeling deeply. Just lightly let things happen and lightly cope with them. I was so preposterously serious in those days, such a humorless little prig. <laughs> lightly, lightly, it's the best advice ever given to me. When it comes to dying even, nothing ponderous, nor pretentious or emphatic, no rhetoric, no tremolos, no self-conscious persona, putting on its celebrated imitation of Christ or little Nell, and of course, no theology, no metaphysics, just the fact of dying and the fact of clear light. So throw away your baggage and go forward. There are quicksands all about you, sucking at your feet, trying to suck you down into fear and self-pity and despair. This is why you must walk so lightly, lightly, my darling, on tiptoes and no luggage, not even a sponge bag. What the hell is a sponge bag? <laughs> anyway, not even a sponge bag completely unencumbered. That's all you need to live right there. All right, a few more. Uh, well, let me just get to the end because I know you want to get in on this conversation. All right. What, let's answer, Steffi, did I see you come in? 
I quoted you earlier. And let's see if we can talk about what Steffi said in that quote about Huxley in Los Angeles. What made Huxley the door to the 60s in Los Angeles? What made him the prism through which all that light came? And darkness, we should add. First of all, I would say suffering. The suffering early on. Suffering is your greatest teacher, uh, if you let it. Sometimes it doesn't matter. It's going to teach you regardless. <laughs> Traveling. What I didn't mention is that he was a travel writer as well. I know you kind of want to hate this guy. There's nothing he didn't do and didn't do brilliantly. But yeah, he, he wrote a, two or three travel books uh, about traveling around Paris, especially in France. Traveling is its own education. When I was a professor, the best courses I ever did were when I took my students out on the road because I didn't have to teach. I just showed them things and we sat around and talked about it. Traveling is its own education. Suffering is its own education. Huxley was a seeker from early on and he found a home in the city of seekers. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Huxley could not have had the experiences he had anywhere else but Los Angeles. For one thing, he couldn't have met the people he met anywhere but Los Angeles. And of course, he would say that the desert was inspirational, uh, as was the city itself. Also a satirist, this is a city of satire, if it's anything. And it, we especially love to satirize ourselves, which I think makes us so healthy, relatively. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, contemplating, as he said in that early quote, contemplating is what gets you to God, the contemplative life. And we cannot underestimate tripping. Uh, we cannot discount that about him because he didn't discount it. And as you saw, he went out of this world on a trip. So. That is Aldous Huxley's mystical Los Angeles. Thank you for your attention.